for us. The Lord Jesus Christ himself said, man will not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. With that, I invite you now to get your Bibles and turn them to Ephesians chapter 6. Even as we continue our lessons from this letter that we have been learning from since the beginning of this year. We're now in chapter 17, I mean verse 17 rather, but just for the context again, we will read from verse 10 up to verse 17. And if you're able to stand, please stand even as we honor God in the reading of His Word. <clears throat> Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for the grace that abounds from you to us, even as we stand in your holy presence, acknowledging your presence even in our midst. We crown you with all these praises and worship, even the songs that we have sung, and present to you ourselves, even offer to you our hearts. And as we have read your word, indeed, may your word renew our minds, even as your Holy Spirit does his mighty work in the changing of our hearts and transforming our lives and fulfill your purpose in our lives, even as a church. And truly, Lord God, we intend to give you, even now, all the glory and the honor for you alone are worthy. And apart from you, we can do nothing. And so, Lord, we thank you for speaking to us, even now, as we ask all this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may all be seated. The title for today's message is The Sword of the Spirit. We're almost done with our journey in this letter of Paul to the church in Ephesus, and I pray and hope that as a result, many, if not all of you, have grown in the grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, even as our minds are renewed and our hearts change and lives transform into the likeness of our master, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I hope and pray that you also are strengthened in your inner being, even as you continually serve him and be faithful unto the Lord. And what we have been learning in this past month, at least, is the fact the reality that we as believers and followers of Christ are in a spiritual battle. That we have an enemy who is the devil who is relentless in his attacks against God's children. Remember, this warfare, warfare is spiritual, which means it is not seen with our physical eyes, but its implications and its effects are manifest or seen. In the struggles and troubles that we face and go through each day in our lives. That is not to say that every trouble that we go through is a spiritual battle. Not every headache or flat tire or any discomfort is a warfare. But 
the devil and his evil forces can certainly use and will use the discomforts and pains and hurts of life, not only to distract us, but to cause us to disobey God, to not to stop trusting and following God so that we seek immediate comfort and deliverance from whatever trouble that we go through. And that's the power of the enemy and the scheme and the strategies. But the good news is Christ defeated Satan on the cross of Calvary and secured a victory over the power of sin and death for us. So that as believers and followers of Christ, we can live, live a life in victory over the enemy. The fact is, as we have heard so many times, God has given us everything we need to be able to stand our ground and not retreat. To stand firm, steadfast, and immovable, and be able to resist the enemy. Listen, God wants you to stand and remain standing even after a struggle or a battle. God has provided us the energy, the strength, the power, the standard, the truth, the peace, the joy, the salvation. In other words, all the protection we need to be able to overcome the enemy and his attacks against us so that we can live our lives in true righteousness, in all holiness, in godliness. God has given us everything we need to ensure that victory and for us to experience victorious living. This is what we read in our text earlier in chapter 6 of Ephesians, starting from verse 10 to 13. It says to be strong and in its mighty power, because our battle is not against human beings, flesh and blood, but against rulers and all these demonic and evil forces and all the hierarchies in the heavenly realms. And so put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you've done everything, to stand. Again, in these verses, we are reminded of what God provided us to ensure our victory over the enemy, namely, the whole armor of God. But we are also reminded of our responsibility of using what God has given us. To use it for us to experience the victory. And that is, our responsibility is to put on the full armor of God that has been listed from verse 14 to 17 that you see again on the screen. We need to put on the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the sandals of peace, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. Now, we already went through the first five pieces of the armor, but in case you have forgotten what each piece is about, here's a brief summary of each piece. The belt of truth, put it on. Don't let the devil catch you with your pants down, so to speak. Walking or living exposed to his lies, put on the belt of truth. Let the truth tie those loose ends in your life. Live your life held together by the truth. That kind of lifestyle requires commitment, commitment from you, commitment to the truth. And the belt represents that commitment as well, your commitment to the truth, to live in the truth, especially during a spiritual battle. You will not be able to overcome the lies of the devil if you're not committed to the truth. Truth, remember, is the word of God. Truth is also a person, and that person is the Lord Jesus Christ. So you can say, let us go be committed to Christ so that we live in his truth, God's truth, and be committed to Jesus, even of who he is. Then there's the breastplate of righteousness. 
which refers to right living. Live the righteousness or in the righteousness of Jesus Christ because Jesus is our righteousness. So live according to what Jesus says is right, not what you feel is right, not what you think is right, or just because you just want something to be right. Live according to what God says is right, not what the culture or society says is right, not what the world says is right, but what the Word of God says is right. You will never fall when you walk according to the righteousness of Christ. Then the sandals or the shoes of peace. Again, Jesus is your peace. He is the Prince of Peace, the one who brought us peace with God and the peace of God, which means that God is on your side. Knowing God is for you and not against you is the ultimate peace. So walk or live in peace. This peace gives you that stability and even mobility, even during the times of battle and struggles of life. You're not pinned down. You're able to move about in your living. So again, these are the pieces of armor that we need to put on and keep on. It's always on us so that we are always ready and prepared for the battle. Now, the next three pieces are the ones that we take. That is when the enemy attacks and the battle rages. You know, the soldiers sometimes when there's a lull in the battle, they put down the shield and remove the helmet and lay down the sword. But when the battle rages, they take all this up. So take these three pieces of the armor, the next three, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit. The shield of faith, this is your faith. That is your trust in the Lord because you trust or your trust is the Lord. Believe God. Believe His Word. Live your life trusting in the Lord completely, no matter what. When the devil attacks you, when the devil tries to make you distrust God, take the shield of faith and raise it up against the enemy. Let the devil know that you believe God, that you trust in the Lord completely by obeying and following His word and not what the devil says. You do that even though your situation may look hopeless, even though you're hurt and feeling helpless, even though things around you are not looking good and things seem that they are getting worse, you choose to believe God. You have faith in His Word. You're standing on His promises like the promise that He said, that in all things God works for the good of those that love Him and are called according to His purpose. So raise that shield of faith because it will extinguish all the fiery attacks of the enemy that is headed towards you. Remember this, you are a child of God and with faith, you will overcome the enemy, his evil forces, even the world. Remember, that's what 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 says. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith, the shield of faith. And then there's the helmet of salvation. Jesus is your salvation. Remember, salvation points to the unending and unchanging love of God. God's sacrificial love for you that, is, that was demonstrated in Christ Jesus who died on your behalf so that through faith in Him, you became a child of God. And that's who you are. That's your identity in Christ. And that is what the devil attacks and makes you doubt in your mind. Makes you doubt God's love for you. Makes you question your identity. 
makes you doubt your salvation in Christ. So protect your mind from doubting God's love for you. Protect your mind from questioning who you are in Christ. Protect your mind from doubting your salvation by taking the helmet of salvation. Now today, we will go through the last piece of the armor, which is the sword of the Spirit. So the six pieces of the whole armor of God, this is what God gave us to protect and defend ourselves from the enemy and his attacks against us. But not only to protect and defend us, but also to fight. That is to say, to be on the offensive, to resist the enemy, specifically with the sword of the Spirit. God doesn't want us to always be on the defensive. If we're always on the defensive, if, we all, we, if all we do in the spiritual battle is defend ourselves all the time, sooner or later, we will get tired, if not burned out. You want always to be under attack? Remember, we are, we are not told to simply stand our ground against the devil and be on the de defensive. God tells us to resist the devil, to be on the offensive as well. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9 says that, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. What does it say? Resist him. Don't just stand there. Resist him. Standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. James chapter 4 says it this way. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil. And what will the devil do? He will flee from you. You want the devil always around you, attacking you? If you want the devil to go away, resist him. Don't just let him keep on attacking you. Resist him. God says resist the devil. Resist the devil. How? By using the, we the weapon that God gave us. And what is that weapon again? It's the sword of the Spirit. Use the sword of the Spirit to resist the devil and use it effectively. Of course, the sword is also a defensive weapon, but it's the only weapon in the armor of God that can be used as an offensive weapon. So use it effectively. How? How can you use the sword of the Spirit effectively against the enemy? Well, first... You need to know your weapon. Identify it. Because it doesn't matter how good or effective a weapon is if you don't know what it is. So let's begin by identifying what our spiritual weapon is. If you go back to verse 17 of our text, it says, Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Our spiritual weapon against the devil and all his evil forces is the sword of the Spirit, which is prayer. Oh, no, it says what? The Word of God. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. Your weapon in the spiritual warfare is the Word of God. Logos. The Word of God, which is the Bible. Remember, the devil attacks us with ideas and thoughts, tempting us in these three areas of life. The, the devil tempts us with loss of the eyes, what looks good, and loss of the flesh, what feels good. And the pride of life, what makes us feel important. The three areas of life where we are susceptible 
and we are given to these things, things that look good and feel good and make us feel someone or somebody. But God gave us a complete armor again to protect us from these attacks. And with the armor, God also gave us a weapon to resist the, ev the, the, de the devil. And that weapon again is the word of God. Every specific word of God that is used in specific situation is divinely powerful to demolish and bring down any and every spiritual stronghold of ideologies or thoughts and ideas, speculations or opinions, theories, viewpoints, philosophical, political, religious, that are raised against the knowledge of God and the truth of His Word. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 4 says, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. In other words, even though we're human beings living in this world of humans, we don't wage war according to human ways and the world's ways. For the weapons of our warfare, warfare are not flesh. It's not of human origin but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy speculations and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We don't use the weapons of this world, weapons of human origin, but the weapon of divine origin, the weapon of God's word. The weapon of God's word to expose the lies and deceptions of the enemy and bring down the strongholds of human wisdom, philosophies, ideologies, and opinions that we hear in the academe, in the universities that have been infiltrated and influenced by the ideologies of this world. Even in politics and religion and cultural discussions, we use the sword of the Spirit, again, which is the Word of God. Why? Why the Word of God? Because God's Word is truth. And the only thing that exposes error or lies and brings every thought that is anti-God or anti-Christ or anti-Bible and held them captive to the obedience of Christ is the truth, which is God's word. You and I cannot and will not overcome the lies and the deceptions of the devil. We will not experience victory in the spiritual battle using anything human or of human origin. Human wisdom, human ideas, human rationale or reasoning, human strength, no. The weapon we use is not of the flesh, but of God. Divine in its origin and in its nature. And that weapon again is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The Bible is the word of God. Believe it wholeheartedly. It is our first and final authority. If you doubt the Bible as being the word of God, if you doubt any aspect of what the Bible claims to be, you will hesitate to use the weapon, this weapon against the enemy in the spiritual battle we are in. Listen, God gave us no other weapon in the armor to use in the spiritual battle to resist the devil with, but only the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Again, the Bible is the word of God, not the word of men. Yes, it was written by men, but men that was moved, men that were moved, in other words, carried along by the Holy Spirit of God. Look at 2 Peter chapter 1, 
verse 20 to 21, where it says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Scriptures, that is the whole Bible, the whole 66 books of the Bible, I mentioned 66 because there are churches and religions that say they have the Bible, but their Bible is more than 66. They've added another set of books called the Book of Apocrypha right there in the middle. That's not the Bible. The canonized, standardized Bible has 66 books. All that is God-breathed. That is to say, given by inspiration by the Holy Spirit of God. 2 Timothy chapter 3.16 says that. All Scripture is God-breathed. Now remember, in the time of Jesus, they didn't have the New Testament, and all that they had was the law and the prophets, which is what they called the Old Testament. And so Jesus validated the Old Testament. So how did the New Testament come into existence? Well, the apostles of Christ wrote the Word of God. And when it, the time came to canonize the Scriptures, the, the Scriptures that they recovered, they filtered it, so to speak, to that which agrees with the Old Testament. The Old Testament was used to standardize the new. Anything that contradicts and violates anything of the Old Testament was rejected. And that's what we have in the New Testament, the 27 books. So all Scripture is God-breathed, given by inspiration, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. This is what the Bible is. It is the authoritative Word of God. It is our spiritual weapon called the sword of the Spirit because it is given by the Holy Spirit of God. Nothing else but the Word of God. Why? Why only the Word of God again? Well, besides that it is the truth, the Word of God is powerful. It is active, meaning it's not dormant or dead. It's not just words written in pieces of paper, it is alive. There's energy, it's functional, it works, and it produces. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, in the authorized King James Version, this is what it says. For the Lord, I mean, for the Word of God is living and powerful. In other translations, it says it's active. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. It's so powerful that it can divide in that which is so impossible, even by a scalpel, the bone and the marrow, physically speaking, but spiritually speaking, the spirit and the soul, which is so entwined. Only the Word of God can discern it. And so because it is powerful or active, it is effective. That is to say, it will accomplish the very reason why the Word of God is not only written but spoken. Look at Ephesians 55, verse 11. I mean, Isaiah. Isaiah 55, verse 11. God says, So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. The Word of God is powerful, it's active, it is effective, and not only that, listen to the other facts and the realities of what the Bible is. First, it is inerrant. Inerrant means there is no error in it. It is free from error. Another way of saying it is the Word of God is pure. It is pure so that the Bible is true in everything it says. 
Look at Proverbs 30, verse 5. It says, every word of God is what? Flawless. Have you been to that beauty shop called Flawless? Where the celebrities go and want to be flawless in their skin. But even after they leave that shop or, you know, you look at their skin, oh, look, there's still a flaw. They're never flawless. Nothing is flawless except God, except the, the Word of God. Other translations use the word tested or tried, which means that the Word of God has been tried. It is tried and found to be without error. It is pure. Psalms 12, verse 6. The word of the Lord are pure words, a silver tried in a furnace on the earth, refined seven times. Psalms 119, verse 140. It says, your word is very pure, therefore your servant loves it. Another translation put it this way again. Your, your promises have been thoroughly tested and your servant loves them. And so the Word of God is inerrant, and connected with that, it is infallible. Infallible means it is not subject to error. It is incapable of falling into error. In other words, it's true in everything it affirms. The Word of God, another way of saying it, the Word of God is perfect. Psalms 19 verse 7 says that. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The Word of God is perfect in that it is complete. It lacks nothing. So what that means is the Word of God is sufficient. It is sufficient. You don't need anything else to use against the enemy. You, need to, you don't need to be smart. You need the Word of God. It is sufficient. The Word of God is so complete and sufficient that God warns anyone adding to it or even taking away from it. Revelation chapter 22, verse 18 to 19 says, I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. If anyone takes away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God will take away his share in the tree of life and in the holy city which are described in this book. That's a stern warning. And I fear for the people that add to the word of God or take away from it. Some people might say, well, that's the revelation and the context is for the book. Definitely, of course. But the principle is applied to the whole word of the prophecy of God's word. Proverbs 30, verse 6, it says, Do not add to his words. If you doubt Revelation 22 says, that's just for Revelation. Look at Proverbs 30, verse 6. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you, and you be found a liar. Oh, there are many people, even in the Christian community, that add to the Word of God, especially the false teachers. And not only add to the Word of God, manipulate or twist the Word of God to deceive people so that these false teachers can accomplish their desire and purpose. The Word of God is complete. Jude puts it this way in Jude chapter 1. Well, there's only one chapter, so verse 3, where he says, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith, that article the faith is not, referring to our trust in the Lord, but the faith, the revealed truth of who God is, of who man is, of our salvation. Let us fight for the truth of God's word that was what? Once for all delivered to God's holy people. 
In other words, God's full or complete revelation of himself, God's complete revelation of man, God's complete truth about salvation is once for all delivered to God's holy people, which is us. No new revelation is needed. Therefore, no new revelation is to be added. The Bible is the complete authoritative word of God. It is everything that God wanted to say. It is everything that God wants us to know in this side of eternity. There is no new revelation that some of these false teachers claim. Last night, I was just meditating and there is this new revelation from God. And God wants me to tell you. God wants me to tell you this revelation. That five years from now, jokers. But people love to hear that because like, yeah, what is that? But when we go to the word of God, it exposes it. And that's why if you doubt any of the word of God and you're given to all these philosophies and wisdom and be careful. God's word is complete. It is sufficient. It is enough, which means, again, we don't need anything else. It is, it is what God has given us to use as a weapon against the enemy to resist the devil with and to make the devil go away. Nothing else will do that except the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And that's why we use the word of God. No other book is of divine origin but the Word of God. Now that we have identified what our spiritual weapon is and what it does against the enemy, let us see what the Word of God does to, what the, what the Word of God does to you and me in helping us in the spiritual battle. There are many verses, if you're willing to stay till five, but let me just give you at least two references back to Psalm 19, verse 5, uh, verse 7 rather, where it says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul, reviving the soul. Don't we need that in the daily struggles of life? We need to be restored. And that's why so many people go to the spa to be restored. Spiritually speaking, you want to be restored. The word of the Lord is perfect. It will restore you. The testimony of the Lord is sure. And then what? Making wise the simple. Wise as in makes one able, capable, knowledgeable, effective in matters of godliness and holy living. That's what the word of God does to you. How about 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17 where... We read earlier, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be what? Complete, equipped for every good work. What else do you need? The Bible says, that all scripture is useful, beneficial, profitable for all these things so that you may be what? Complete. Mature spiritually. Equipped. That's why we need to spend time. Spend time. With the word of God. So now back to the question earlier. How can you use the sword of the spirit effectively against the enemy? Well, first you need to know your weapon against the enemy. That is to say, identify it. And we did that. Your weapon is the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Next, you need to know how to use your weapon effectively. Doesn't matter if you've identified what your weapon is. Doesn't matter how good and effective your weapon is. 
if you don't know how to use it. And not just know how to use it, but don't know how to use it effectively, that is with precision. Some of you perhaps are gun owners, but let's not go there. Let's just talk about a soldier. Imagine a soldier having the best gun, powerful, but if he doesn't know how to use it, doesn't matter, does it? And just like the sword of a Roman soldier, which is probably about 18 inch in length, the type of a sword, not the three feet and four feet that we see, the Excalibur, by the grace. No, it, it's more of like a short one for hand-to-hand -hand combat. The soldier is trained how to use it. The soldier doesn't go into the battle without any knowledge or training, especially in how to use the sword. The soldier doesn't, just doesn't hit the enemy with the sword and just flailing like that. The soldier can poke many areas and accomplish nothing until the sword hits precisely the area that brings a fatal wound. And so with us, spiritually speaking, we need to know how to use the sword of the Spirit again, which is the Word of God, effectively with precision. If we don't, if we're even ignorant of what the Bible says in a certain area of our lives that the devil is attacking, we are defenseless, vulnerable in that area. It's interesting, if not amazing, to listen to many so-called Christians who've been in church for, I don't know, 20 years, and yet they don't know what the Bible says in a particular area in their lives. And when the devil attacks that area, they don't know. Vulnerable, defenseless. So if you want to successfully defend yourself against the Satan's lies and deception, and all these tricks or tactics and clever strategies, you need to know the Bible and know how to use it properly. The devil cannot defeat a child of God who knows the Word of God and knows how to use it properly and effectively. And that's why the devil would do everything to discourage you or even stop you from knowing the Bible and how to use it properly. Satan hates a Bible taught, a Bible learned, truth filled believer and follower of Christ. And that's why, again, Satan will do whatever to discourage you, even just to read the Bible. He will make you busy with many other things that seems important so that you make that a priority instead of God and His Word. He will make you busy so that you can say, I don't have time. He will make you feel tired. Maybe tomorrow I'll do that. I mean, haven't you noticed when it comes to reading the Bible and studying the Bible and learning more of God and His Word, even through personal Bible study, you're suddenly busy. If not, you're so tired and so on and all these other things. But then when your friend calls you or texts you to celebrate whatever good times, come on! Celebrate good times! Come on! <laughs> Doesn't matter what time or where, doesn't it? That's how the devil works and his forces. So be aware of the strategies of the devil. As the Bible says, be alert and be vigilant. There's this battle for your soul. Be alert and be vigilant in the spiritual battle that you are in. It is vital, it is necessary to know how to use the Word of God effectively. And how do we do that? Well, first, you need to know the Bible. Not just know things about the Bible. That's a different thing. You know things about the Bible. 66 books. God breathed. Those are things about the Bible. You need to know it. As in, know what the Bible says. And so here are suggestions. 
so that you will know what the Bible says. Let's begin with read it. To know what the Bible says, you need to read it. Start with reading the Bible. Do you read the Bible? You need to get the Word of God. Its contents, everything that God wants you to know, you need to get that in you, in your mind, in your heart, in your life. So get into the Word of God and get the Word of God in you. And you start by reading the Bible. Well, some say... They cannot read the Bible for some medical reason, you know, their eyes. and Well, fine. But thank God that in our modern technology, we now have what we call an audio Bible, where you can hear and listen to the Word of God read to you. Someone with beautiful voice in the beginning, God, you know, you can hear the, the, the reading of the Bible read to you. In other words, there's really no excuse. So again, to know what the Bible says to know what's in it, read it, or listen to it read to you. Next, as you read the Bible or listen to it, understand it. Understand it. Don't just read it. Don't rush through it. Oh, I need to finish this from Genesis to Revelation, and it's my goal for one year to read the whole Bible. That's not the goal. The goal is to know what the Bible says. And if you're just reading it without comprehending it, that's not what God wants us to do. Don't rush through it. Read it slowly enough to comprehend what you're reading. Read the passage, if necessary, several times. And that's where some of you might say, well, I read the Bible, but I cannot understand what I'm reading. Well, listen. Listen. If you are a child of God, born again in the Spirit, you can understand the Word of God. I mean, if you're not a child of God, if you're not born again, then you cannot understand of God. But if you are born again and made alive in the Spirit, that means you have the Holy Spirit in you. And having the Holy Spirit in you means that you can and you will understand the Word of God eventually, ultimately. This is what 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12 to 14 says. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spiritual taught words. The person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, but considers them foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. This is not a matter of being intellectual, superior thinker so that you can understand it. These are spiritual words taught in spiritual truths taught in spiritual words. And the only way to truly discern and understand it is through the Spirit of God. And if you don't have the Spirit of God, you won't understand it. Oh, yes, you may understand the semantics and the meaning of words, but it's spiritual truth and relevance and reality and significance. You won't. And so again, if you have been born again, you have the Holy Spirit in you who helps you and gives you the understanding you need in the Word of God. And that's why you need to pray first, even before you read the Bible. Pray for understanding, and God will give you the understanding, even the wisdom of His Word, so that you may learn it. So pray, then read the Bible with understanding. Another way of putting all this is this word. Study the Word of God. Don't limit yourself in just reading it. Study it. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, in the King James authorized version again, it says, study. In other translations, it says, be diligent, which is associated with studying. Work hard at it. Go into the discipline and the training of studying. 
That takes diligence. In other words, child of God, wake up and don't be lazy. You're in a spiritual battle. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed and rightly dividing the word of truth. And don't you love that old English? Study to show thyself unto God and a workman that needeth not. Make sure you have an umbrella when you're sick. <laughs> but it's just a poetic way and it just... I love King James Version. Do you study the Word of God personally? Do you attend the Bible studies? It's already on Zoom and live stream. I'm tired and I don't have to exactly. That's the devil's strategy. You want to be victorious in your living? God has given us the key. Now, after studying, meditate on the Word of God. That is to say, digest it mentally and spiritually. Think about it so that you grasp what it means and not only what it means, but how it applies to you and your life. Just like when you chew or digest food in your mouth, you break it down so that its nutrients can easily be absorbed and be part of your body. Meditating or thinking about the Word of God makes it part of you. You retain it in your mind, you keep it in your heart, and it will be part of your life. When the Word of God is in your heart, when the Word of God richly dwells in you, you will be able to speak the Word of God, for out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So speak the word of God. Verbalize it. Share God's word to someone. Articulate it. Because when you teach what you know, you retain that. That's one way of retaining. You teach it, you share it. You retain that in your heart and in your mind. So get into this practice and this discipline. Train yourself with the word of God. Read it. Study it, meditate on it, speak it, share it to others regularly, constantly, make it a habit, a practice, and you'll get good at it. And it is then and only then when you will be able to properly use the Word of God precisely against the enemy and effectively resist him so that he flees away from you. When we go back to our text in verse 17, and I don't have it in the screen anymore, but probably our media group can just punch in that verse 17, where it says, take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Remember that Word of God phrase? In the original language, it really says, Rima. Rima means spoken word of God. This means that the sword of the Spirit is actually spoken word. Which means you and I need to verbally speak the specific word of God that addresses the specific situation that the enemy is attacking you in. Let the devil hear the specific word of God Addressing the specific area or situation that is under attack. Let the devil know that you have the sword of the spirit and you know how to use it. And when the devil sees or hears that you know how to properly use the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, the devil will flee from you. This is what happened when Jesus himself spoke the word of God against the devil. Remember when the devil tempted him in the wilderness? That's found in Matthew chapter 4. And I don't have it in the screen either. But in Matthew chapter 4, remember this is when Jesus, after 40 days, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, the devil 
came to tempt him and says, well, you're the son of God. You have the power to do everything. Why don't you turn this stone into bread? I mean, don't wait for the Father to provide for you. Do it yourself. What did Jesus say in response? It is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then after that tempta temptation, the devil took Jesus into the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and says, why don't you jump? Because the Bible says that he will not let your foot be dashed. And what did Jesus say in response? I mean, Jesus said, verse 7, it is written again, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. If that was not enough, the devil took him to the high mountain and showed him all the glories of this world. And the devil said, you know what? You don't have to wait to be declared to be the son of God. You can have all these things. I'll give it to you if you would just bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him in verse 10, Get away from me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and him only you shall serve. You notice what Jesus did when he was tempted and attacked by the devil in person? What did he say those three times? It is written. It is written. It is written. Jesus did it. Save me, Lord. He stood up and moved. It is written, devil. That's how you use the sword, the word of God effectively. Verbally speak the specific word that specifically addresses a given situation or area in your life that is under attack by the enemy. Don't just use any verse for any situation. So that when you see a wallet laying down there, then you're being tempted to steal it. Oh, the, the message said to speak the word of God. Oh, this is the word of God I know. Uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his own son. That whoso that's not, that's not going to do it. When you're tempted to steal, the word God so loved the world has, has nothing to do with that. What's a good word? When you're being tempted to steal whatever, to take from. Well, how about Psalm 23? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I've got everything I need. The Lord being my shepherd, I don't need to steal. How about if you're being tempted to do something immoral? Watch pornography. For God so loved the world that he gave. The, and the devil was saying, is that the only verse you know? And sad to say, for many Christians, that's all the verse they know. It's not a laughing matter, too. And that's why many Christians are living defeated lives. And they're tired. Why? Because they're not resisting the enemy. They're not using the sword of the spirit. All they have is all this protective gear. <laughs> hit here. Hit here. Hit here. Attack here. Spiritually speaking. And now they're burned out. Pastor, please pray for me. Yeah, we can pray for you all the time, but you know what God says? Stand up and stand firm and put on the whole armor of God. Go down the list. Do you have this? Are you being attacked? Then take up the shield. Put on the helmet and take the sword. And what? Resist the enemy. See that? Do you do that? If not, sooner or later, again, all, you, if all you're doing is defend. You'll get tired. So speak the specific word of God that is applicable. But again, how can you verbally speak God's word that specially, specifically addresses a situation if you, don't, if you don't have the word of God in your heart, even in your mind? And how can you have the word of God in your heart and your mind if you don't know what the word of God says? And how will you know what the Word of God says if you don't even read 
let alone or much more study the Bible. So again, read your Bible, study it, meditate on it, speak it as in share it with others regularly and make it a habit, a practice, and get good at it. Get into this discipline and train yourself with the sword of the Spirit again, which is the Word of God. And you will be victorious in the spiritual battle and effectively resist the devil, even the forces of evil. This is a sure thing if you truly have faith in the Lord. If you have faith in Jesus, remember you have been given everything you need to live life in all godliness and victory so that you can be like Christ. Because if you think about it, every piece of the armor represents the Lord Jesus Christ. Truth is Christ. Righteousness is Christ. Our peace is Christ. Our salvation is Christ. Our trust is Christ. The Word of God, the sword of the Spirit, is Jesus Christ. So put it plain and simple. Put on Christ and live in the victory of Christ by faith. But if you don't have faith in Jesus, you don't have any of the spiritual truths that is given to a believer. You don't have any spiritual blessings in Christ. If you don't have faith in Christ, the Bible says that you don't even have life spiritually. You are spiritually dead because of your sin. That's the condition of everyone who don't have faith in Christ. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And the payment of wages for our sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever will believe in Him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Let us pray. Thank you, our Heavenly Father, for your word. Thank you, Lord God, for teaching us with your word. And truly, may your word accomplish your purpose, your will for us, not only individually, but also as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord God, for the comfort your word brings, the strength that it gives in equipping us to be the people that you have called us to be, to live the lives that you have called us to live. So I pray, Lord God, for that person or individual who has not yet believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, that you will give that person that faith and whoever you are, I pray that you would do just that. That in your heart, that you would come to the Lord and in all humility, call upon His name, repenting of your sins. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ in your heart and then be baptized in His name. If that is your prayer, I would like to know so I can pray for you and help you in your walk with the Lord. And now let us worship the Lord, even to our tithes and offerings, and as we sing our closing song. I'm so